welcome to Wonder Grow On, the show where we dig into questions about agriculture and try to understand how food production impacts us and our world. My name is Hallie Casey, and I studied and currently work in agriculture. And I'm Chris Casey, Hallie's dad. Each episode, we pick an area of agriculture or food production to discuss. And this week, we are focusing on persimmons. <laughs> I am so excited to talk about this fruit. Per persimmons, persimmons. You used to say parsimmons. I still say parsimmons sometimes. Yeah, you do. How, what do you know about the persimmon, Dad? Um, I know there's this guy on YouTube that's trying to <laughs> eat them, and they are a fruit. Judging by some pictures that. I saw maybe they're a berry. Okay. And that's all I really know. Yes. So there is, I posted in our One to Grow On Discord, quick plug, if you're interested, you can go to com slash Discord about, yeah, there's this guy who has a YouTube channel. I was subscribed to him from back in the day, a million years ago, and he kind of revitalized his channel recently to try and like persimmons, which is not as easy of a task as one may think it is. So persimmons aren't very likable, I'm guessing? So they can be likable, and we're going to get to that. They can also be distinctly unlikable. All right. So you're right. Persimmons are berries. Good Aha. job. They're in the genus Diospyros in the family Ebenaceae, which is the ebony family, which is known for the dark wood that is used in carving. Oh, so does it have the same kind of wood? No. Oh, it's just related to a tree that has that kind of wood. Exactly, yeah. All right. There are lots of different kinds of persimmons. The most common one is Diospyros khaki or khaki. I don't know which one it is. Uh, that's the most commonly produced one commercially. Um, it's native to mainland China and parts of Japan, and you can buy it most places here in the U.S., depending on seasonality. So that's the one that you usually see in grocery stores. Cool. There's also Diospyros nigra, which is native to Mexico and parts of Texas. That's The common name is the chocolate pudding fruit. Wait, is it called that because it tastes like chocolate pudding? I feel like I would have heard of this fruit. <laughs> it's called that because the flesh is very dark, like chocolate pudding. Oh. It's also called the sapote okay. in Spanish. Sapote? I still haven't heard of it. Well... It's native to our region. There's another one that's native to our region called Diospyros texana. Okay. Do you know anything about Diospyros texana? Is it from Texas? It is, yeah. It is from Texas. Okay. You have eaten this persimmon. What? Yes, you have eaten Diospyros texana. No. Yes. Really? Yes. They grow in the central Texas hill country. Are they agaritas? No, they're not agaritas. They're that's not a berberus. Agaritas. It's different. Okay. So so what is it? When, it, when have I eaten this thing. Probably when you were traipsing around the central Texas hill country. I think I ate some with you. I ate some with Catherine this last summer when we were down towards Big Ben. We like I made her stop and eat some because they were fruiting at the end of the summer. But they're like these small, they don't really look like the commercial ones. The commercial ones are big, kind of like a like a large beefsteak tomato size. Um, these Diospyros texana, the, the Texas persimmons, are Maybe like the size of like a large marble or like a little bit bigger than a grape. And they have like some big seeds on the inside and they are dark purple in color and they stain your teeth and they're pretty delicious. Okay, but I wasn't with you when you went to Big Bend. I know, but I'm pretty sure that either me or your mom would have forced you to forage some some Mexican persimmons or Texas persimmons at some point. Mm, I don't remember this, but maybe. Did, I bet it. I bet so. Did producer Catherine like the persimmon when she ate it? I think she did. Yeah. I mean, it's a lot of seed. It's not bread. So okay. it's it's a lot of seed. There's not a lot else in there, unfortunately. Um, but they do. They are often harvested to make things like puddings or breads or, you know, different stuff like that. I've never had persimmon pudding or persimmon bread. Now I'm very curious. I had it once in college. We had a professor who, like, f to celebrate our, our final, I think, like, baked us some persimmon bread. And I think she made something else with, like, a native plant. It was really cute. Everyone should become an ag major because your professors always bring you food. Okay. You say it was really cute, but was it delicious? 
I thought it was delicious. Yeah, it's like it's kind of like a like a prune and nut bread, like something that's like kind of like sticky and you put nuts on it. So it's got a little crunch to it. But the persimmons themselves, the Texas ones are, are really kind of thick and puddingy, similar to the sapote. Did everyone else think it was delicious? I don't remember. I was a very self-centered teenager. Okay. I'm just trying to get a beat on how this thing tastes. Yeah. So, well, that's the Texas one. You can't usually buy those ones. You have to know when they're fruiting and then go out and forage for them. They're actually starting to flower right now, which is a little early for them because everything in here in Texas has been flowering a little bit early because it's been a warm winter. Um, So they'll probably be coming in in like June or July where they usually come in around July or August. But... That's pretty much all we're going to be talking about, Diospirus texana, because right. most of the episode we're going to be talking about Diospirus khaki or khaki, which is like the commercial one. The ones from Japan. Yeah, and mainland China. Okay. So I first learned about the Japanese persimmon when I was in my post-harvest class when I was at grad school. Do you know what post-harvest means? Does it mean how to pick plants? No. How to store plants? Yes, exactly. How to store plants. And the reason we talked about this for persimmons is because persimmons are very hard to store in a way that makes them delicious. Okay, so I remember you could store the apple up to like a year, right, in giant silos. And I was shocked. So is the persimmon not similar? It's not similar in that when you store an apple, you kind of pick it and then you chuck it in a bin. Whereas with the persimmon, you have very different kinds of persimmons based on the cultivars. And then how you store them has to be really, really intricate. So really quickly, persimmons, uh, we don't grow a lot of them a lot because of these issues with storing them. Uh, We grew 7.9 million tons in 2018. That sounds like uh, a lot. It sounds like a lot. Yeah, it's like 17.4 billion pounds. Yeesh. Most of that was grown in China. A lot of that was sold in Eastern Asia because it's more common to eat it there. It's kind of more in the cuisine. People are more, you know, experienced with eating it. Uh, Here in North America, it's not as common, like, to be put in the cuisine, partly because it has had some issues being grown here in the U.S. Um, pretty much all of the persimmon growth in the U.S. comes out of California. And there's a lot of competition for California real estate. There's a lot of other crops that are jockeying for those fields. So if you haven't quite cracked the persimmon uh, like recipe on how to grow it perfect and then market it, then it's hard to do it in a way that's economical, because that land is just so valuable. And so many things we eat come from there. It's true. Okay, so like you said, 17.4 billion pounds. How do people consume these billions of pounds of persimmons? I'm wondering. A lot of them are eaten fresh, just like fresh produce. You can also put them in things like jams or in desserts or in other things like that that you would put a sweet fruit in. But for the most part, they are known as a fresh fruit that you would eat, kind of like how you would just eat an apple or something like that, where you just chomp it. Does it have to be uh, peeled or anything like that? No, no. You just chomp it. You just get in there and chomp it. And Japanese persimmons um, have seedless fruit. You can they, they have bread cultivars that are seedless. So that's nice because generally the persimmon seeds can be pretty hefty. So that's quite nice if you're just going to chomp something. If there's no, there's no seeds in the side of it. All right. Well, you know, when I'm editing the episode, it feels like I have to chomp a cut when we go into a break. Chomp, 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 chomp. Chomp, 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 chomp. Chomp, 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 chomp. Dad, did you know that we have a Discord channel? I did know that. I'm it's even pretty active great in, in there. It's a lot of fun. We also have a Facebook group, uh, both on the Discord channel and on the Facebook group. Dad and I post all the time. Lots of other folks who listen to the podcast come in and we talk about plants and all the plants that we're hoping to grow. And there's right now, actually, in the Discord, there's a whole channel just dedicated to wildflower pictures. And it's amazing. It's like my favorite place on the Internet right now. If you just want to come and discuss how beautiful the blooms are, that's the place to do it. It's true. There's some great pictures. Um, People get advice on 
the plants that they have, if they're not doing well, maybe they need water or maybe they need sun or something. And people talk about that. And I make hilarious jokes all the time. And it's great. If you want to join either the Facebook group or the Discord, you can go to onetogrowonpod.com slash Discord or slash group and find us there. That's onetogrowonpod.com slash Discord for the Discord and onetogrowonpod.com slash group for the Facebook group. And a big thank you to all of our patrons, especially our Starfruit patrons, Patrick, Vikram, Lindsay, Mama Casey, and Cheyenne. Thank you guys so much. Should we get back to the episode? Back to the episode. Okay, Dad, do you have any true fact for us? I do. I'm ready for it. This one I came across just randomly. Uh A friend of mine named Kevin posts the Austin improv schedule every day. And in that schedule, he posts a random fact. And one day his random fact was about the Rocky Mountain locust. Okay. Which was one of the dominant pests of the 19th century. And he said that uh, one swarm in April of 1875 covered 200,000 square miles. Wow. Yep. But over a period, I'm not sure when this started, but over a period of about 30 years, agricultural development in the Rocky Mountains accidentally destroyed the locust nesting grounds and made the species completely extinct. And now North America is the only inhabited continent without a locust species. Wait, I thought locusts were the same as grasshoppers. I was pretty sure that a locust was the same as a grasshopper. And so now I'm really, wait, or is a locust a cicada? Locusts are neither grasshoppers nor cicadas. I think some people call cicadas locusts, but they're not the same. I am very surprised by this news. Right? They do. They, if you look up a picture of them, they do look a lot like a grasshopper. Yeah, they, I'm looking at what I Googled it. I, they look... Oh, in fact, this says it's a species of shorthorn grasshoppers. Okay, so it's like a specific kind of right. grasshopper. So we have other grasshoppers yes. that are not... So yes, a locust is a grasshopper, other... but a grasshopper is not a locust. Right. Okay. Okay. That's very interesting. Did you know there's also trees called locust trees? No, I had no idea. Yeah, they're in the legume family. We have a lot of them here in Texas. Do they make beans? They do make beans, yeah. Nice. Yeah. da 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 Nature fact. Nature fact. All right, so in the first half of the episode, you used a word that I didn't ask you about, which was cultivar. Yep. What is a cultivar? So a variety is a specific blight what do we call it we call it a we don't call it bloodlines because plants don't have bloodlines do they have chlorophyll lines (laughs) Uh, that has to go in the outtakes because i was not on my mic when i said bloodline all right (laughs) which is a shame does it have a genetic lineage yeah so varieties is basically a specific kind of like a breed of plant kind of like you would have a breed of dogs but the things that's different is that varieties are naturally occurring so you just have some plants that cross a bunch and maybe they're a little bit geographically isolated and they start kind of doing their own thing in a way where it's not like they can't get with other plants that are still in the species, but they keep doing something that just makes them a little bit different. Um, Sometimes this has to do with flower color or like shape or size. Um, But the word cultivar was invented to describe basically breeds of plants that were actually bred. So it's short for cultivated variety. Okay. Kind of like selecting for a seed for some plant. Mm -hmm. Basically, it's like that. You're just just breeding... You know, the ones you want. Right. Yeah. 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 Seed, like seed breeding. Um, there's all kinds of crossbreeding and stuff right. like that that, yeah. so, that so goes cl- into. They're not clones. Mm-hmm. No, they are not okay. clones. But A clone yeah. is a plant. Usually if you have a clone, then it has some kind of plant trademark, which is different than a cultivar, but s- similar in a lot of ways. But just taking our favorite plants and breeding them. Exactly. Most of these Japanese persimmons are producing seedless fruit, which is great, but Some of these Japanese persimmons with seedless fruit produce astringent fruit. Do you know the word astringent? It's kind of a weird word. I remember when I learned it, I had no idea 
what it meant. I do. I used to make beer. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. And if I did something wrong or, or left something in the mash or the boil or something too long or something wild got in there that shouldn't be, then yeah, it would have an astringent flavor and it was not good at all. Yeah, astringency can mean like acidity or bitterness, generally just kind of a gross flavor that can't really be described any other way because it's a flavor. It's like trying to describe colors. It just is what that is. It's true. So the persimmons that are astringent, that do become astringent, have to be eaten super duper soft. Whereas if you have persimmons that have been bred to be non-astringent, then you can eat them super crisp like an apple. And I guess different people just have different preferences as to which persimmon they like. And presumably they're marketed as such. Like if I go to a persimmon grocery store, then you have the astringent persimmons and the non-astringent persimmons, sort of like you'd have golden delicious apples and uh, what's the one that goes in pies? Granny Granny Smith. Smith? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, very similar to that. Um, The most common astringent persimmon is a hachiya. The most common non-astringent one is a fuyu. Um, That's true that like different people have different tastes, but also whether or not it can be sold crisp has a really big impact on how long you can store it. Because if you have to keep it around until it's real squishy, then that can be an issue for getting it out to market because then you usually have a pretty short shelf life. Do these ripen as they sit on the shelf or in storage? Yeah, so the astringent ones can. Um, The non-astringent ones can as well, but you're not as concerned with ripening because they're already tasting good. Um, Whereas if you have one that tastes bad, you really have to make sure it's ripe. Got it. So one of the wild things that scientists have found is that if you take persimmons that have astringency, you can, what's called, cure them before they go to market. You mean like jerky? (laughs) Uh, what happens is that you usually have these persimmons that are put into a big room or like a just some somewhere that's that's airtight, and they are brought up to eighty percent CO two for twenty four hours at twenty degrees Celsius, and then after that they are not astringent anymore, but they can still be firm. Weird, isn't that wild? I'm trying to picture that just a bunch of persimmons in a room with. High concentration of CO2, and it changes the flavor. Yeah, it changes the flavor without changing the firmness. So you can also cure these astringent persimmons um, if you put them in 10 parts per million ethylene at 20 degrees Celsius. Um, But then they usually go soft really quickly. So unlike any other fruit, really, we use high concentrations of CO2 to cure the persimmons while maintaining firmness. There's not really any other produce, as far as I'm aware, that you do this with. Most other things, when you're doing post-harvest, you have to use ethylene or some other hormone. CO2 is not a hormone. It's wild. So to answer my earlier question, no, that's nothing like curing beef jerky. (laughs) I don't know that much about beef jerky. Which you just cover in salts and spices and stick it in the fridge for a day. I mean, it is also stuck in somewhere for a day. So in that sense, that's true. Sure, And a cold place for a day. And it does presumably change the chemical composition since it comes out with a different flavor. So Mm -hmm. scientists discovered that this happens. Did they discover the mechanism for this happening? Uh, They might have. I have not discovered it, however. Got it. So I have one more fun persimmon fact. So Unripened persimmons, these astringent ones, have shebiol, which is a soluble tannins. Tannins create astringency. It's why we don't eat things like acorns, because they have a lot of these tannins in them. Boy, do they ever. So shebiol polymerizes when it comes in contact with a weak acid, such as stomach acid. And so if you eat a lot of unripe persimmons, it can polymerize in your stomach and form what is medically known as a bezoar. Hold the phone. Yeah. So when you say polymerize, you mean like turn solid. Yeah, turn solid into a gross little stomach rock. Wow, that's amazing. Is that not amazing? It's super weird and kind of gross because if you look on the Wikipedia page, they have a lot of photos of like jewelry that was made with bezoars. I mean, I mean, once a bezoar forms inside of you, I feel like there's only one way to get it out. Yep. 
Pretty much. And people want to wear that as jewelry. Yeah, a lot of them aren't human bezoars as well. They are bezoars from things like goats. Okay, well, which is what it is in the Harry Potter books. But, exactly. I mean, is that really more gross than coffee that's been pooped out by beetles or whatever? I think it is. I know a lot about that that coffee that has gone through a digestive process. I don't think it's that gross. Okay. We can do a whole episode on coffee, and I can get all into the poop coffee. All right. Well, I'm looking forward to some poop coffee. Now I want to see what a bezoar looks like. Oh, there's one with hair sticking out of it. Yup, it's coming from your stomach. Oh, dude. I mean, there's not hair in your stomach. Yeah, whatever. I mean, if you're an animal that eats animals, there probably is. Thanks for listening to this episode of One to Grow On. This show is hosted by me, Hallie Casey, and Chris Casey. It is produced by Catherine RJ and Hallie Casey. Our music is Something Elated by Broke for Free. Connect with us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at One to Grow On Pod. You can find all of our episodes as well as more information about the show and the team on our website, one to grow on pod.com. Join our community and learn more about each episode at patreon.com slash one to grow on pod. There you can get access to audio extras, fascinating follow-ups, and even custom art created just for you. If you like the show, please share it with your friends. Sharing is the best way to help us reach more ears. Be sure to check out the next episode in two weeks. But until then, keep on growing. Bye, everybody.